Hello, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science with the best minds in the field. I'm Sajam Sangari, and this episode's topic will be the recent discovery that one of the major risk factors of people with COVID-19 was inherited from Neanderthals. The discovery will prove helpful regarding advancements with research about the virus, as well as gaining a deeper understanding of COVID-19. With me today, I have Dr. Hugo Zieberg from the Department of Neuroscience in the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Dr. Zieberg is an expert on gene flow between Neanderthals and humans and a key author of the study demonstrating this discovery. Welcome, Dr. Zieberg. It is an honor to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad to be here. So before we begin, I think it's important for the audience of our podcast to get to know the basics of Neanderthal genetics, as that is your specialty. So how were Neanderthals genetic makeup different from modern Homo sapiens? And what specifically changed in their genetics throughout evolution uh, that made them become modern humans? Okay, so Neanderthals are not our ancestors. They are more our um, Eurasian cousin. Uh, so Neanderthals um, left Africa some, uh, the estimates vary, say half a million to a million years ago. And then they were inhabitants of Eurasia, mainly Western, uh, Western Asia and in Europe. And they lived there for a half a million years, at least before modern humans entered the scene. Um, so th- it was a separate lineage. And then mo- Europe, all people outside um, uh, Africa shares some Neanderthal genes by interbreeding with this group. Uh, so they have ancestry with Neanderthals, but they're not our ancestors, but rather a separate lineage. And most of the Neanderthal gene variants are falling within modern human variation. They are not as distant as we perhaps believe sometimes. Uh, however, there are certain features of Neanderthals, such as that they have was probably a small, um, a small group, uh, small po- effective population size, meaning that the more positions are homozygous, they, they, they don't look so diverse as modern humans. So that's perhaps the most important to remember that uh, the effective population size was smaller. And we have Neanderthal genes from uh, genomes from uh, uh, a, a vast area, both in space and time, and they look surprisingly similar. So, so that also talks to that they were um, genetically somewhat different in that sense. And that also causes you to acquire more uh, rare variants. So um, a little bit inbred, one can say. Right. And from what Sorry I for understand. A long, long, long answer, but it was an uh, interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. So from what I understand, there are a significant amount of these uh, other human-like species that sort of also derive from the same ancestors, but are not exactly ancestors of Homo sapiens. So is it the case that all of these different species also have genetics that are somewhat intertwined with modern humans? Um, There is another group called the Nisilans, which is an even further, more East Asian Cousin, one could say. Uh, then there are speculation about other groups and if we interbred with them, but so far we have no firm evidence of that. So we, it's basically Neanderthals and the Nisivans. And the Nisivan ancestry you find mainly in East Asia and not so much in, in Europe. Right. And so talking a little bit more in detail about your experiment that you were able to show, what was your research team able to do or discover about Neanderthal genetics in regards to COVID-19? Okay, so I'm also a, a physician, which is kind of uh, unusual combination to be a medical doctor and also an evolutionary geneticist, or, uh, an aspiring evolutionary geneticist. Um, so I worked in the clinic during the, the pandemic. Uh, and I thought uh, we must understand why some people get so sick why other people have such a mild course of disease. So we, we must genotype them. Um, however, we have, I quickly realized that you need to collaborate 
to do this. So there was a big international effort to, um, to um, create a large genetic association study, basically finding the genetic variants that people have that end up in the hospital. Um, and one day I got that release from one of our first releases of that, that year was uh, from COVID-19 Host Genetics Initiative, which I belong to, uh, which is led by, by FIM and Broad Institute, uh, FIM in Finland. Uh, and I had the Neanderthal genomes, I've worked with the Neanderthal genomes for the last couple of years, and I decided why not compare them, compare the gene variants that people have in, with severe COVID to Neanderthals. And to my surprise, it was the biggest genetic risk factor was a Neanderthal variant. So it was, it was really one of these discoveries where you just fall over it. It was not the long, it was just, uh, it was such a big surprise to me when I saw it. Right. So you would say it was a very um, accidental discovery on yes, the part of you and your accidental. institute. Exactly. It was an accidental discovery. Indeed. I see. And so when you say that the gene involved that uh, you talk about is a major risk factor uh, for COVID-19, what exactly do you mean by this? Like what, what extra danger does someone uh, who possesses this gene face if they contract um, the coronavirus? So, um, you have a approximately twice the risk if you carry this variant to end up in hospital. And that's quite substantial for being a genetic risk factor. Um, we are not sure how this really translates if you're homozygous, you carry two variants, if that's not, uh, four times the risk or if it's just two times the risk. Um, but it's quite substantial, so twice the risk to end up in hospital. Um, so trying to tr translate that, that would mean 10, 15 years, perhaps, of additional age. If you, everyone knows that age is a strong risk factor. So quite substantial. Right. So that seems like it is it a lot of extra uh, danger to an individual who has um, this Neanderthal gene in their body as yeah. well. Especially for being so common. I mean, there are, of course, rare variants where people are very likely if they have this extremely rare variant, if you're some immunodeficient or so or so. Uh, but for being such a, a common variant, so 8% or 16% um, carry this variant in Europe and half of people with South Asian ancestry carry it. So for being so common, it, it is a very strong risk increase. Right. So you mentioned people in um, specifically in Europe and parts of Asia where I know that Neanderthals were also prevalent when they, uh, when they lived. So besides these or including these, are there any other certain uh, demographics or locations of people that are more likely to have this gene and then thus are more susceptible? Yes. So first to answer the question regarding when Neanderthals lived and what present people lived. So people have moved around during the last 100,000 years. It's a quite typical thing. For, for humans to, to, to move, to migrate. Uh, and we believe that the majority of gene flow from Neanderthals happened very early when modern humans entered Eurasia. And then there has been then later on several extra pulses, extra uh, events when they have, a, have, had, uh, when they have mixed these groups. Um, but this ancestry is probably quite deep. Um, what is striking with this variant is that it's, it's missing in East Asia. And that's weird. It's so prevalent in South Asia, but it's missing in China, it's totally gone. And so it's prevalent in Europe and uh, South Asia and also in Native Americans and also in actually in, in Indonesia um, and, and parts of uh, Oceania. It's very frequent among Papuans and it's frequent among native aboriginal, aboriginals in Australia. So it's actually very common in a lot of places around the world. It's common a lot of places, missing in Africa because uh, Afri uh, there, there's very little gene flow um, into Africa, especially south of Sahara. And then it seems to be expunged or, or wiped out in East Asia. So that might actually have been something that might have happened there. There might have been a previous coronavirus epidemic that has removed it. Right. So I was actually going to ask you about this as well. 
So you mentioned that specifically in parts of Africa and um, uh, parts of Asia, specifically, um, I think it was East Asia or places yeah. like that. It's very uncommon to have this gene. So do you have any theories or like what's the best theory for why I mean, it doesn't uh, exist in these uh, places? Uh, one should say that now we enter into the realm of, of, of speculation. And I think it's allowed to speculate. One should just be kind of clear when one speculates. And um, coronavirus, I mean, this virus and also previous um, like SARS CoV 1 and uh, emerge and have um, reservoirs that in species that live in certain areas. So there might have been previous coronavirus, not worldwide uh, pandemics, but epidemics in that area that have actually removed this variant. And that is what we believe. So we are currently trying to look for old genomes in East Asia, see if we can find the population that had it before some kind of coronavirus event or some other thing that removed it. But that is an active uh, line of research now. And we don't really understand why it's missing. On the other hand, we can also be, be surprised by the high frequency in South Asia, because it's much more common than other Neanderthal variants. So there it might have been positive in some sense. I see. And so I'm sure that a lot of studies have been done, uh, or I know a lot of studies have been done to determine uh, which demographics or locations of people are more susceptible to COVID um, just in general, not having to do with genetics. Yes. So do you think the discovery of the Neanderthal risk factor gene, uh, ad in addition to all of that, would give more detail to studies like this for the future? Yes, I do think so. One should keep in mind that there are other very important risk factors. I mean, the, the most well-studied and what people we know is the age. And when one compares countries, one should keep that in mind because median age varies a lot. Uh, I think median age in Italy is 46 and in India is 26. Oh, really? So that's 20 years of difference in median age. And there are many countries in Africa that have a median age of 18. So the, uh, people, the demographics looks very different in different countries. And one should keep that in mind, of course, when one compares um, number of deaths and so on. The best studies one can do is if one wants to understand individual groups that are at more risk is to study them within a country. And there have been reports from, from Public Health England where one had studied um, minorities. And there, actually, South Asian minorities are at more risk in, in, in the UK, more so than people from East Asia, actually. So that kind of fits with this. But I should also stress that there's a lot to learn here. Yeah, most, uh, excuse me, most studies that um, have to do with COVID-19, especially because it's such a novel, uh, a novel disease, um, are definitely very early on in the process of research. So I can, I can see why everything is so um, early or su subject to change in yes. uh, all research. So I wanted to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, I, yes, I mean, you're absolutely correct. But uh, in, that, in that setting, I find it very amazing also how we collaborate. We have learned so much about this virus just in a year. And we have done so by international collaboration. I'm, I'm on almost daily Zoom call with people that I, it feels like I know because I talk with them so often, and researchers from all over the world. And we collaborate and share data and share hypotheses and, and that's it's quite amazing that such an, a tragedy which the pandemic in many sense uh, is can, can also bring out sometimes the best of us best of us right and definitely the amount of destruction that this virus has caused uh, in the last year really spurred sort of a worldwide effort to try and you know yeah. take care of it as fast as possible mm. so i also wanted to ask you that uh, you mentioned previously that you know for sure that there are a significant amount of people in the world who you know possess this Neanderthal gene. So because you know this information now, do you plan on publicizing these findings for specifically those people who have this gene so that they can maybe take extra precautions or know that they're a little bit higher risk? Okay, so that's a tricky question. One is that um, 
the most straightforward way to determine um, if you carry a risk variant is, is to one, use one of these custom uh, genotyping arrays, like 23andMe or Ancestry. Unfortunately, this variant is not typed by the chip. And that was the previous uh, arrays, 20, the earlier 23andMe arrays had it, but not, not recent ones. So it's not, it's not super easy to actually uh, get this, the genotype of this. You can do whole genome sequencing, or you can impute, but that requires some bioinformatics knowledge. So it's, it's not so easy to find the individuals carrying the variant if, if you're not, you're a scientist yourself. Um, but one should also stress that if, if we now assume that this adds 10 years of extra age, then if you're 20, then, that, then, then you have the risk of being a 30 year old, you're still not at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so one should not, uh, it's, you need to find some kind of, you need to balance this risk somehow. Uh, it might be important if you're some borderline where you're 60, 50, 60 and have this variant or some other risk factor, hypertension and so on. But one should really stress that there are lots of risk factors. And I think the general advice is always to kind of uh, keep social distancing um, and, and, and be careful. Right. No, I absolutely agree that uh, simple measures such as social distancing, wearing masks, very easy to do, and it'll definitely help in the future um, to prevent the virus. So you meant, sorry, what, what go ahead. Could add, what, could else add also that um, I think what we talked about now is important, which is kind of risk assessment. But another thing that is also of interest, or two other things that I find interesting. One is, well, how can genetics kind of, um, what can we learn about the disease from studying host genetics? Um, can we find routes and pathways to understand how the virus kind of gets into the body? Uh, can we develop drugs from this or then the targets that we are seeing here? Uh, so that's one part. And the other part, which is perhaps not so saving, saving humanity, but it's also interesting from an evolutionary perspective. Um, so there are, there are lots of interesting stuff going on here. I see. And so previously when we were talking about um, like publicizing it to people, you mentioned that a lot of genetic tools such as 23andMe and kits like that don't have this specific gene um, in their sort of database. So do you think now that you realize that this is a risk factor gene, do you think you would recommend these companies to sort of add this into the database of genes? Yeah, no, I think that all people should, um, uh, I mean, I think it's important to, to that people should have some kind of autonomy over their own, he over their own health. They should know, if, if, if they like to know, they should be able to know it. So, so why not? Uh, one should also kind of um, be clear a little, about, a little bit about the terminology. So one should say gene variant. It's not the Neanderthal gene. We have it, uh, I don't know, we, I mean, modern human had a variant or ma actually many variants and Neanderthal had a variant that was then introduced into modern humans. So it's, it's several, it, there are variants of genes the Neanderthal uh, contribution. And this is actually a genomic region carrying several genes. Uh, we, are, we are not actually, we are trying to figure out which gene is important here. There are genes for involving receptors in the immune system that we are studying and, and others too. I see. And so I was reading your research paper, which was very interesting. And uh, in the research paper that your team published, um, you talk a lot about something called a Neanderthal haplotype. So could you explain what exactly a Neanderthal haplotype is and what its significance is in your discovery? Yes, so um, from our, if we, if we start very easy. So the first offspring, the first baby with the Neanderthal mother and, the, and, or, and say a modern human father or the other way around. Uh, then we will have uh, one copy of, of each chromosome from the father and one from the mother. Then this chromosome gets uh, by a, a phenomenon called recombination broken down to smaller pieces. 
So when we find gene variants in, in people today, it's not an entire chromosome. It's, it's a small chunk, a small segment of DNA that, is, uh, that carries several variants, but are always inherited together. And that's a haplotype. So it's basically, a, uh, in this case, 50,000 base pair, a chunk of DNA that, that you inherit from Neanderthals. I see. OK, and then. So is this gene variant that causes the risk factor of COVID-19, um, like specifically because it's a variant? Did this evolve from a specific um, Neanderthal from a specific location, or was it more of the species uh, Homo neanderthalensis in general? Uh, we do. Uh, the sun positions in this are uh, vary across um, Neanderthals and other are shared. Um, so we are, we don't know the, we don't know which nucleotide it is. So in the future, we might be able to say that we are trying experiments now to kind of figure that out uh, by doing genome editing and other techniques um, in the lab, in like wet lab. And then we can say perhaps this variant here is the causal variant, and that is carried by some Neanderthals and not all. But there are differences here between the Neanderthals, uh, which is also of great interest. Right. And so it must have taken a large amount of effort and time to make as well as prove your discovery that you made with your team. So I wanted to ask, how did your research team come up with this hypothesis? Because I know you mentioned it was very accidental uh, in its process, but could you give a little bit more of a light on that? Yes. So, I mean, well, um, let me put it like this, that to what people have done in the last 10 years with recovering the Neanderthal genome. That is an enormous amount of work. Uh, what the GWAS team, we did all over the world to, to together kind of create that, that GWAS was also a lot of work. But then when I saw the connection, for me, it was not much work. Uh, so I wrote this paper together with Santa um, Pebble, and we actually wrote the whole paper in three days. So. Uh, it, it was, uh, it was um, quite, and then we had to review it and, and fix a few things. But basically, uh, it was it was crystal clear that the gene variant was exactly the same. And what we do in that paper is to describe that uh, that this variant that we find in, in hospitalized COVID patients is the same variant as we see that people have from Neanderthals. So it's, it's basically connecting two data sets. I see. So it was a very, uh, you would say, a procedural method in sort of proving what you discovered and all of that. Yeah, I want to perhaps say that. And then, and then I had this one of kind of eureka moments. Oh, gosh, is it like this? Uh, and then, of course, I have worked with, with kind of proving this for other um, uh, loci in the genome. Um, gene flow from Neanderthals. I had the techniques ready and I had my scripts ready. Um, so I had, I had, sometimes you need to be at the right place just at the right time. And I, at that time, I just happened to be there. Right. And so you mentioned um, sort of a connection between your work in evolution as well as your work as a medical doctor. So besides uh, what you're working with right now with Neanderthal genetics, have there been any other times where sort of your work as an MD uh, working with patients and your work with um, the Evolution Institute, have they been interconnected with COVID? Um, that's, that's a good question, I wonder. I mean, we, we try all the time to kind of, uh, the, you generate hypothesis in the clinic, of course, uh, and that is your own experience, but also from colleagues' experience and from other clinicians. And that kind of helps if you're a medical doctor to kind of uh, read clinical papers uh, and then to translate that to, to um, um, evolutionary um, uh, genetics. So that helps, of course. Um, I, also I also find it um, if I should, I don't know if I'm at the right position to give people advice, but it's always good, I think, when you find just a niche, you find your, uh, there are 
a lot of extraordinary good people at population genetics. And if you're not the best population ethics, then you have to find your own kind of little, little corner. And um, I'm, I'm trying this weird combination of emergency medicine and evolutionary genetics, which uh, I enjoy very much. Right. And it's interesting how you chose uh, a combination of these two uh, fields and found so many different ways to sort of integrate uh, different aspects of both of them and um, do really good experiments with it. That'll definitely help a lot of people. So adding on to this, uh, I wanted to ask you that, so we know that the coronavirus has been prevalent uh, in a lot of societies around the world for about a year now. So do you believe that your discovery um, that you wrote about will allow researchers to further understand the virus through research and other procedure? Um. That's a very good question. Why, why, why should it be critical? I can say, why does it matter to, that, to know that this is from Neanderthals? Does it really matter? Um, and uh, I mean, I talked about it before that it's, it matters because they have an, um, a scientific interest in itself. Uh, there, there could be some hints from evolution. Uh, we could get some to try to understand why it's missing a certain population. Uh, why is it so frequent in, in South Asia? We know that cholera is prevalent there. There's one gene interacting with the cholera response. Uh, could that be a part of it? And here, to, to kind of phrase this in evolutionary, um, in evolutionary context can give hints, I think. So I think it could be more of a, um, to kind of widen your perspective a little bit. And that might, might help you to, to understand things. Right. And when you took part in this experiment uh, as a medical doctor, you did so with a specifically evolutionary institute that was focused on um, these kind of genetics. So do you believe that anyone at your team or anyone at this institution have begun doing further research into the risk factor uh, gene variant that you discovered after the study was published? Are you going to continue to help with that? Yes. So we are continuing. Uh, we, we are very actively working on that. Uh, it is, it has proven quite hard. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, techniques and experiments. A problem is, as I mentioned before, you get this long piece of DNA from Neanderthals. So then we need to figure out which part of this piece is actually causing this. Uh, so that's a challenge. Um, but we are doing several different things to try to figure it out. Uh, and other labs too. Uh, there's, there's of course a lot of interest in, in this this gene variant. Right, and uh, I also wanted to ask, with the knowledge that you have right now um, about your discovery, what do you believe as of right now are the real world applications of what you've discovered with the Neanderthal gene variant in relation to COVID nineteen so far? Um, I mean, this if one uh, irrespective of the evolutionary um, um, history of this variant, this, this variant is, it carries uh, several immune uh, um, modulating, um, immune receptors modulating the immune response. Um, if one could target one of those, that might of course be uh, waited for future treatment. Um, I mean, we know that um, some of the critically ill COVID-19 patients, what they respond to is, is uh, cortisone to kind of dampen the immune response or dexamethasone, which is so, it's also kind of dampening. We know there's, uh, there's this phenomenon, some people call it a cytokine storm. And there are certain cytokine receptors here. So perhaps one could have a more targeted treatment. That would be one option perhaps. See, and so your discovery uh, has must have a lot of these implications for further study, as we've talked about before, uh, especially as scientists and researchers around the world are essentially in a race to stop the virus as fast as possible um, before it can cause an extreme amount of damage to the population. So I would like to talk about your discovery in the context of not just your institute, but for the global research community. 
Um, and we mentioned a little bit about this before. So as a conclusion uh, to the interview, how would you recommend that other scientists and researchers around the world sort of build on your discovery of this risk factor gene to further understand COVID-19? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, we are, there are of course several ways to kind of expand from here. Um, and some people might not be, there will be a debate about, or one could argue about how important is it to prove that it's from Neanderthals. I should be clear and say that this finding that particular gene variant without knowing its evolutionary origin, that was a collaborative effort, not done by me, but by a large collaborative effort. Um, but the, we, we are now uh, trying to um, uh, study this, taking people that carry this variant in the hospital and trying to, to understand why are they there? What, what are, is there something specially happening with them carrying this variant? Do they get more thrombosis? Do they get more heart attacks? Do they more often require mechanical ventilation? So going from, a, from a one discovery, you need to characterize it in much more detail. So that's, that's the way forward. Uh, and also to see how this interacts with other, um, with other, other risk factors. And finally, I think it's imperative that we learn more about the biology of the disease or the pathology of the disease. We need to kind of understand uh, much, much more uh, about um, viral entry and what parts of the immune system are triggered and when and where. Um, and this whole connection to the to thrombosis, we need to understand much more better than we do today. Um, and that's and I think it's important, even after the coronavirus ends, this pandemic ends, that will also be crucial information for the future. Oh, absolutely. And um, again, Dr. Zeberg, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to interview. It was so interesting talking to you about, uh, about your discovery on Neanderthal gene variants and their implications for COVID-19 right now. I think the work that you're doing is incredible. It has so much benefit, especially at this time uh, of the pandemic. Again, thank you so much. It was an honor to have you on the podcast and good luck with the rest of your uh, research with the Evolutionary Institute and as a medical doctor. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this interview and it was very um, good and, and intelligent question.